everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we've had, we're excited to have uh, our third Pride speaker. We've been doing this for three years now. Um, and we first, I just want to say um, that this session will be recorded. So I know some who can't join during this time frame, but it will be recorded. Um, and we do encourage people to write questions. And if you want to put them publicly, that's totally fine. Um, but Nicole uh, is on the call, Nicole Bechko, who can also take questions directly, uh, privately, if you'd like. Um, we have Greg uh, Bard here today with us, uh, focusing on acceptance, inclusion, and community, uh, which is timely and very important to us, a forder. Um, I just want to emphasize that this work doesn't, it goes beyond Pride Month. It's not just Pride Month. Uh, and as you all have seen from our all hands that we had about a month ago uh, with the results from all of our DIB efforts and actions that we're going to be taking. It is a real priority for us. Um, and I will now pass it over to Greg to take it from here. And I don't want to cut too much into his 30 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Baird. I'm uh, coming to you from my wonderful little small abode here in Chicago, Illinois. So it is about eight o'clock in the morning here. And I understand in Tel Aviv, it is 4 p.m. So you're probably a little bit more awake than I am right now. So uh, hello, uh, just coming off of our, our Pride Parade here in Chicago, which was here uh, yesterday. We had a million people in my neighborhood. So I had a lot of people over for lunch yesterday. So without due uh, time here, we got a lot of stuff to cover and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with Porter and uh, kick things off. I have a lot of stuff to talk about today. And you're gonna see me towards the end. I got a really nice PowerPoint for you today and any questions would be appreciated at the end of the lecture. So uh, let's rock and roll here, as I like to say. So first off, if uh, you would like to get a hold of me, uh, here's all my uh, contact information for you on, uh, of course, on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and also um, all my other kind of stuff through my agencies and things like that. Our Pride events have looked a lot different this year. And uh, as you know, we're coming uh, from a couple of years. We haven't had a whole lot of Pride events because of uh, the horrible COVID and different things, but we're back together. We're doing a lot of great things. And a lot of questions I get are all these different flags and different things that we've seen. And uh, what are we really celebrating? Well, for one thing, it'll be 46 years uh, ago tomorrow that the Stonewall riots happened. And we have to remember that pride is rooted in protest and activism. And a lot of our transgender and non-binary folks are the ones that really fought for us at the very beginning. And we need to uh, make full advances of that for them as we go forward into the future. But the question I get asked a lot is, what the heck is this progress flag? And like, I don't get it. Well, we have the pride flag, which is in the top left-hand corner, which was developed uh, in 1978 by Gilbert Baker. And then the progress flag, flag uh, was in 2018, designed by a graphic designer and decided to add the non-binary and the folks of color onto the flag to make sure everybody was inclusive. And of course, we're all inclusive, even with the flag that Gilbert uh, Baker did, but we have a lot of flags that designate different parts of our community. And maybe there's one there that uh, signifies or identifies uh, who you are and what your beliefs are in going forward with our fights for equality. Yes, you can laugh at this picture. I brought my family with me this morning. They're happy to be here. And I'm showing this picture to you because I had a very unique upbringing growing up. And one of those was I came from a very bigoted and prejudiced family. And so you can see my family here. My brother and I are both adopted. And um, we had some very interesting outfits here. Actually, you can see where my mother's hand is behind me in the photo because she's pinching my back fat because I hated the, the clothes I had on. Um, so I guess I was a young gay, gay boy growing up there knowing that what I had on wasn't the best outfit in the whole world. And my mother looks like something stepped out of Star Trek uh, with her fancy outfit. This is picture is I'm gonna date myself here, it was probably right around 1970. Uh, but um, learned a lot of hate when I was a kid and I always knew that things were different uh, for me. And I, I didn't accept the fact of a lot of the jokes that we heard about different kinds of communities, Jewish people, black people, gay people were always told at our kitchen table during dinner. And we were always told we need to laugh. Uh, 
I grew up in a small uh, little town in Michigan here in the United States. And I remember when a black family had moved into our community and on our Sunday drives, my dad made it uh, his mission to drive by the family's house. And we were always told uh, from my father, he says, okay, boys, I want you to roll up the car window and lock the door. Now, mind you, when you're telling your children that, Growing up, you're telling them whoever's on the other side of that door, that car door, they're bad people. They could hurt you. And uh, not a good mission and not a good thing for my parents in relating that information uh, to us. So when you grow up with that, you know, I knew that it wasn't the right thing. And uh, we moved out of that. My favorite picture of my brother and I is this one. I just had this redone. It's actually on my wall. And I'm showing this to you because, yes, I always made this obnoxious little face. And uh, my brother's the quiet, timid guy. But my uh, parents didn't realize when they adopted two boys from two different families, they were going to get da -da, two gay sons. How amazing is that? So uh, my parents hit the homosexual lotto, which uh, wasn't their uh, favorite thing in the whole world. But uh, my brother and I get along quite well. We're quite different from each other. He's down in Florida taking care of my father right now who has dementia. And uh, I appreciate all of his efforts that he's doing. So my question for you is, what is your story? I think storytelling changes hearts and minds of policies. It changes people's minds. And we live in a world where we need a lot of change and going forward, a lot of positive thinking. And I uh, shared you a little bit about my story. And also, I'm going to share with you a little bit about uh, the legacy. And what is your legacy? What are you going to be remembered for? Uh, the turning point for me, I worked in higher ed several years ago, and uh, I became friends with Judy Shepard. Judy Shepard is the mother of Matthew Shepard, who was a gay college student, was killed on the fence in Laramie, Wyoming in 1998. So around 2000, um, I had the year 2000, I was invited down to my college to speak, which is Central Michigan University. A year later, Judy Shepard was uh, offered to come back and speak at my old college, and she asked me to introduce her down at my school. I said, absolutely, I'll come down and introduce you. You have to understand, at this time uh, of my life, I was being offered a full-time position to come and speak uh, worldwide uh, speaking, and I was working in higher ed, and I didn't know if I wanted to leave a really nice kind of cushy job with good benefits and, and start all over again. So <clears throat> I was kind of debating on what I was going to do. I gave the intro uh, for Judy Shepard at the, at the lecture and sat down in the audience. And during the course of her talk for 45 minutes, there was a group of college students that was there with a huge banner paper signed, signed by uh, people within the, the residence hall and asked if they could meet Judy and give her as a gift, this banner paper, the sign that they've done. I said, sure. Well, I was with my friend, Tim, uh, and we we're walking through the audience. I, went up to the front after everything was done and introduced the students to Judy. And while I was walking there, there was this cute little red haired girl in her young twenties was uh, yelling at me from the side of the theater while we were walking forward. And she was like, Craig, Craig, waving. And uh, my friend Tim said, do you know who that is? I said, I have no idea. We got to the front of the theater and I'm standing there and the girl goes, oh my gosh, it's you. I said, yes, I hope it is. <laughs> And she said, I am so happy to see you. And I said, well, do I know you? And she goes, well, you were here a year ago and spoke, right? I said, yes, I was. And she goes, I knew it was you. She goes, I always said, if I ever saw you again, I want to say thank you for coming to CMU, Central Michigan University, to speak. And I said, well, thank you very much. And she goes, well, I'm not finished yet. I said, oh, okay. And uh, she said, I had no intentions of coming to your lecture, but I came I really enjoyed it. I love the message about coming down on our own terms and everything. And you gotta remember, this is years ago when uh, I talked more about coming out issues back in the day. It seems like the college students are more interested in hearing about coming out issues than a lot of gender topics, which are uh, favorable now. And I said, well, thank you for coming to the lecture. I'm so glad you said hello to me. And she goes, well, I'm not finished yet. And Tim said, well, you need to let her talk. And so, she goes, I was in my residence hall and I had my backpack with me and I was walking out and I saw the sign for you to speak. And she said, well, I thought, what do I have to lose? I'm going to come and listen to you speak. She goes, what I didn't tell you is uh, the reason I was leaving my residence hall 
is I had left a map to my roommates on two locations where they were going to find my body because I was going to kill myself. And I have to tell you, when she said this to me, the sound all around me just faded away. And she said, I came to your lecture. She goes, you know, I thought about coming out to my parents. I was in a bad relationship with an older female here at school that was treating me bad. I wasn't doing the best with school and because I, I just had enough with life. And I listened to you, what you had to say, you inspired me. And she goes, I know you told us not to run home right away and come out to our parents, but she goes, I did. And my parents love me just the same. I got rid of the, the bad girlfriend. And she goes, I'm, and in two months, I'm gonna be graduating with honors here from Central Michigan University. And I always said, if I ever saw you again, I wanna thank you for saving my life. And I looked over at Tim, he actually was a puddle on the floor crying. And he, Tim said to me, if that doesn't tell you what you should be doing for the rest of your life, you are a complete idiot. And that young lady, like maybe some of you may have inspired somebody and has changed your way of thinking or has inspired you down the road. That young lady literally changed my life and what I'm doing today. So uh, that's my continued legacy when I'm here and why I'm sharing this program with you today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about LGBTQ plus allyship. And it's really important that we're talking uh, about allyship, especially now, some people call it a co-conspirator, a collaborator, a uh, complice, a uh, kinship, uh, a great friend. And it's somebody who's uh, basically giving over their power, their authentic self to help. Uh, with people in marginalized group. And it's not just the LGBTQ plus community, but it could be uh, to help women and people of color, uh, just to give them a real access to leadership. So what an ally is not is what I wanna start off. And many of you know this, but I just wanna make sure we have an understanding currently what's going on in our world. But we have uh, our hate crime statistics right now in 2022, the global hate crimes currently reported uh, has been the highest record in two decades. I'm sure uh, a lot of you are not surprised by that. Uh, when we're going from like one on down race and ethnic bias, the black community are the most targeted group, the LGBTQ plus community, the transgender community, the most targeted group in our world. Uh, religion, Jews are constantly the most targeted religious group. And then we go gender, gender identity, non-binary, and then disability. And again, hate crimes against the LGBTQ plus community were up 23% in 2021. Uh, the stats are continuing to go up in 2022, uh, which continues to bother me being an empath like I am uh, when I hear stuff every day. Uh, we have something here in the United States called the Southern Poverty Law Center. They document a lot of hate crimes and hate groups. We have 733 active hate groups currently in the United States and globally, they're made up of white supremacists, uh, far right, uh, ethno-nationalist movements uh, in Europe that continue to thrive. We have a lot of anti-LGBT uh, groups here in America, the KKK and onwards. So just make sure uh, when you're protecting yourself and your community and your loved ones, know where these groups are at and know uh, when you're going to a large, a large event and things just look out for one another. You know, we're human, we need to look out for each other. So a lot of these groups, uh, these are just some recent pictures that I was able to take off the, the net. The, the top left group was just in Coeur d'Alene, Aline, Idaho uh, for their Pride event a few weeks ago. Uh, a white supremacist group showed up and they were caught before the Pride Parade, uh, which is good. They had a lot of people on hand to really take care of the issue. This bottom left-hand photo for everybody that's <clears throat> uh, in Israel right now, I don't know if you were at this parade, but I'd be interested in uh, the chat section or when you wanna ask a question. Uh, you had a, a person that came in and disrupted your pride parade in 2005. And um, he stabbed some participants while he was put in jail. It was an ultra uh, Orthodox Jewish uh, member but in 2010, uh, oh, excuse me, in 2015, he came back uh, after he was released out of prison and stabbed a bunch of more people, which is the picture on the bottom left, at the Pride Parade in 2015. So we have, <clears throat> we have a lot of work yet to do 
It's not all hate and awfulness, but we have a lot of work to do in bringing people together and understanding. And we're going to continue to have these kind of battles. And um, again, we need to change a lot of policies and how we're doing things and make sure that education is the key for anything. This is a group here in America called the Westboro Baptist Church, or better known as the Phelps family. Now, I usually ask the audience by a show of hands, how many of you know about this group? And um, I'm gonna show you, this is an extreme group here in America. And I, and I wanna make sure that those of you that have any kind of religious affiliation know that I'm not going after any religious group when talking about them. They love the media. They like to be out in the media. They have nothing to do with any kind of religion at all. Although they quote a lot of Bible verses and things like that. But what an ally doesn't do is show up at these rallies with these folks showing up here. And what they will usually do, they'll come at a pride event. They will come in your hometown if you're doing some kind of a play that's very uh, uh, liberal about uh, the gay community or if you're doing something on uh, the Laramie Project, which is about a Matthew Shepard. But they'll show up, they'll pick it, they'll cause those signs. And what they do is they'll stir up so much emotion and commotion with people that a lot of the people uh, that are protesting them, they'll wind up, somebody will probably get hit uh, or threatened. And what they do is they'll sue that person. They usually win, they're all lawyers, they'll get money and they'll go on to their next event by the money that they won from that individual. Um, so hate is alive and well with this family, but with like my family, uh, when we had a lot of hate in my family, I can tell you how it can go from your children. On the top left-hand corner, this is the Phelps children. Uh, and so that's their daughters. And who do you think the children to the right are? And if you're thinking, well, it may be their grandchildren, that's absolutely true. So not only has that family taught their daughters how to hate, they have taught the grandchildren how to hate as well. And it's a shame that uh, you can kind of understand what would happen when they go into their own schools and uh, community. And the bottom left is the grandfather that started all is Reverend Fred Phelps. And on the right, it's just a current sign that they use um, in uh, attacks here uh, in dealing with our schools and things here in uh, the United States, saying it was uh, because of our liberal views on different things that uh, this is why the shooters come into your community. So don't come to when they come into your community, but have a peaceful protest somewhere else. We need to have focus more on peace and peaceful things and fun signs. And, and you know, it's okay to, to be gay. God loves gay people, uh, you know, blessed to be LGBT. Uh, you know, don't judge and, and, and have it at a different location. Let the people that hate have their own spot and let them fester, but let's uh, celebrate peace and all the joy that we have. And we need to have more of that in our world. And talking about allies, this is a really wonderful guy. Uh, this is Aaron Jackson. He's a straight ally champion. He uh, developed a uh, company called planningpeace.org. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he's a humanitarian and environmentalist. He has dewormed 22 million children worldwide. And, and something fun on August 17th and uh, 2016, he sent a pride flag out in space. <laughs> Kid you not, you can find the video on YouTube, but sent a pride flag out in space and he wanted to make sure that it declared the U.S. and the world uh, pride friendly and accepting and, and everything. So he's a great guy. What he did do, and I love this, he found a house in Topeka, Kansas. And it was a white, just a, a typical white house. He bought it and uh, a military veteran agreed to paint the rainbow on the side of the house. Now, it was then deemed as the equality house. And it was a place where... Uh, planningpeace.org did have their offices up until 2018, but you can go there and visit. There's been a lot of weddings. There's been drag shows outside uh, to help in anti-bullying efforts. Uh, there's even a garden in the back. And I heard that one time you could go and, and pick like, uh, you know, a tomato or something in the backyard and go home with it. So I just hope they had a lot of tomatoes and a lot of people showed up. So uh, what he did the following year uh, is he bought the house next door and they called this the transgender house for a while until they changed the name on uh, June 26, uh, 2016. It's now called the Mott House after Stephanie Mott. And she was a transgender activist 
uh, very well known in Topeka, Kansas. But the best thing that I love about all this, everybody, is the Phelps family that I mentioned to you are from Topeka, Kansas. And where do you think they are? They're right across the street from the Equality House. So when you're battling hate uh, and you want to use something peaceful, what do you do? You paint a rainbow house across the street from them. And uh, I did ask Aaron if, uh, if any members of the Phelps family ever came out. And he goes, well, one time Shirley, who's the, the icon now of the family, was coming out. You see the mailbox there was getting her mail. And he goes, I asked Shirley what she thought about the colors of the house. And she said, well, it's kind of pretty. And that's all that she said. So I just love the fact when you're when you're battling hate and all this damage that uh, this family does, that uh, you're doing something peaceful across the street. So an ally, you know, everybody's on a different spectrum with an ally. There's some people that um, you, you say, well, I don't want to be in the parade, like the pride parade we had here in Chicago yesterday. And I don't feel like I want to be in the parade or I, I, I support everything. I just don't want to be there. So, you know, you're just maybe starting to get it. Um, maybe you're focusing your time on being an ally and you're really supportive. And then there's the super ally who I know uh, people have the buttons and the pins and all those kinds of things. And, you know, they're the marchers and the parades. So whatever spectrum that you're on, it's great. And, and know that your path of an ally is a journey, just like your life. So um, I tell you, probably my brother is uh, even though he, he's a gay man, he's he's an ally. He's kind of a quiet ally. My dad is still kind of learning. Um, so my dad's still at the, the the yellow person there. He's focusing his time on learning. And my dad will be 94 in September. So, uh, but again, he's an ally and, and that's wonderful. Uh, everybody's on a different spectrum. So an ally is someone who is not a member of uh, the underrepresented group holds a position of privilege and power and can advocate and take action to support the less represented group. So please understand your privileges and, and you share those privileges with the underrepresented group. That means learning what you have to gain in homophobia, biphobia and transphobia uh, and know what community means to you, what community means to your, I'm gonna throw this in your coworkers, your family, your friends and be willing to learn. And that's where the whole storytelling thing comes in, because when we, we, we share our stories and get off our cell phones and look at each other, we learn a lot about one another. This is something that I do all the time. I did it during uh, Pride, but it's called optical allyship. And I'm sure a lot of you do this. You change benign things on social media. So maybe at your home and office, you're like, oh, well, it's uh, uh, it was Black Lives Matter, so I'm going to change my screen on my computer, or uh, I'm, I'm going to put the pride flag on my computer, or put a little pride flag out, uh, which I have here, and then you can see me, a little pride flag. So I have my pride flag out. So that's kind of an optical allyship, and that's great because people going by your office or your home or whatever will, will say, hey, uh, I saw that. What a great thing. Listen and take direction to those who have lived experience of marginalization and oppression. And those of us uh, who have marginalized or oppressed, we don't take breaks. We never have a break. Uh, listen to understand, ask questions, ask people about their journey, be honest about yourself. Uh, and again, we live in fear because we're not communicating. And that's not just a US situation. It's universal. We're just not communicating. And we need to do uh, be better stewards of ourselves and our communication. Show up for one another in solidarity, community events, meetings, and presentations like this one. Thank you. Uh, everyone's involvement and ideas are valued. Understand and use correct LGBTQ plus pronouns. I wish I had more time to talk about a lot about that, but understand the pronouns. And I'm gonna give you a resource at the end of this lecture that you can check all that out. Uh, allies do have family history. My family has a, a family history, trust me, and learn from your past bias or any prejudice you may have and move on from that. Um, you know, we, we have several stuff that we've done in our lives and you move and you learn from that. You move on and what positive changes you will do. And you build bridges between people and different groups and understanding that comes with the whole storytelling. And join forces with other allies. It's so important. Be a friend, include others, share your story, share your interests. You're going to find that you have a lot more in common than you thought.
And I want to put on here, uh, it, this is great to know that Israel is one of the most inclusive societies in the world. The Tel Aviv uh, Pride Parade brings about 100,000 people uh, to the community, and it's just a really great place. They, um, since the 1960s, was a, a forefront in helping a lot of people that were repressed. So, so um, a wonderful thing. This is a picture for one of your, your parades. It looks like a great time. Uh, the LGBTQ plus community and allies need to be a mentor to all our youth and, and globally. And there's still a lot of uh, problems with our youth being rejected, uh, especially in these times. And over 400 LGBT youth in Israel were rejected by their families in 2021. We need to have a safe haven for everybody, our youth, our elders, everybody else that is suffering from being in a repressed society. So again, we need to look out for one another and provide services and help whenever we can. And here, as promised, is some um, uh, resources for you. The Freedom House, uh, really great resource. It works to defend human rights. It's a democratic change, focus on political rights and civil liberties. And uh, this is all over uh, the world. And feel free to write all these down or take a screenshot of these. Uh, Guide to Allyship, uh, becoming a more thoughtful and effective ally. Guide to Allyship.com. The Southern Poverty Law Center. Great resource for anybody globally, and uh, especially in the United States. The Human Rights Campaign, the HRC.org. I use a lot of information. Those of you that are trans, know somebody who's trans or non-binary, uh, the translifeline.org is wonderful for resources and all sorts of information and help. The Equality House I mentioned with the planningpiece.org. You can find out more on what they do uh, in, in that history of that whole organization. And last, we did this very quickly so I can get some questions for all of you. I love this quote, live your life from your heart, share your heart and your story will touch and heal people's souls. And I feel like I've done that with a lot of folks and my shameless plug. Um, if you ever want to get a hold of me is gregarbaird.com. And uh, yes, that's a little pride parade picture of me from when I was in Palm Springs, California, which sounds really nice right now. So I'm gonna switch the ski screen here, see if you have any questions. And thank you, I, I usually go for like an hour. So uh, this is just, uh, I'm trying to get a lot of time in here as much as I can and I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Greg. Very welcome. If anyone have questions in our last minute that you wanna put in the chat, probably take one, give it a second. All right. Any on your end, Nicole, privately? I haven't got any. Some thank yous. Okay, we'll just wait it out. Well, I appreciate uh, the time that everybody took and then for Florida to have me come this morning and chat with you and, and get to know new people and stuff. And feel free to reach out. I'd like to hear from a lot of you. Uh, they mean a lot to me. And, and the time- Oh, and we have one thing, right? We do have people in the- uh... Tel Aviv office that aren't online. So Verit, you can give me a wave if anyone has questions. I see Verit in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> anyone has questions? She's looking, they're looking back. You good? No? Okay, no questions. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Greg. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Have a great time, see you. <clears throat>